and welcome Hoosier fans to this week's edition of Assembly Call Radio, where each week we discuss the most interesting topics in the world of Indiana basketball. This is our 176th edition of Assembly Call Radio, and it is our 631st episode overall of the Assembly Call recorded on the evening of Thursday, July 2nd, 2020. I'm your host, Brian Tonsoni. And let's begin this edition of the Assembly Call, how we begin every edition of the Assembly Call, and that is with our Hoosier Proud Banner Moment. And Indiana is the national champion. When it comes down, Indiana will be champion. Smart takes the shot. The Hoosiers have won the national championship. This week's Banner Moment occurred on Wednesday when Scott Dolson began his career as athletic director at Indiana University. Scott takes over for Fred Glass, who retired after spending 12 years on the job. Dolson has been Fred Glass's right-hand man for several years, and the transition hopefully will be without concern. Fred Glass helped stabilize the Hoosier Athletic Department. He oversaw many facility projects that have moved IU up to speed in college athletics, the north and south end zones of Memorial Stadium, Cook Hall, Bart Kaufman Field, Andy Moore Field, and Wilkerson Hall, as well as the renovations of Simon Scott Assembly Hall. He also stressed the importance of the student-athlete by creating the Student-Athlete Bill of Rights. Glass hired a few coaches, all in attempts to move programs forward, and he created the motto, 24 Sports, One Team. However, no administrator goes without criticism, and criticism on a variety of issues, issues like those coaching changes, the flagpole, and fireworks. Regardless, Fred Glass made decisions based on what he believed was best for Indiana University, and that is a banner moment. Fred Glass has left his role as athletic director, but Indiana University will forever be impacted by his work. He left Indiana Athletics in better shape than when he began, so thanks, Fred. Job well done. Now up, Scott Dolson. Nothing like getting started in the middle of a pandemic. May your day, Scott, be full of joy leading Hoosier Athletics despite the tough road ahead in the upcoming year. Let's go Hoosiers. Okay, now let me introduce my esteemed co-host for this week's show. To my left. You have fun, fun, fun. Fun, fun, fun. Fun, fun, fun. Fun, fun, fun. Andy, what is your bottoms line on the last week in IU basketball? I think, like you said, the big story of the week is really the the changeover in athletic directors. And uh, as you said, hard to think of a, a more strange scenario to be taken over that role. The good thing, uh, though, is that Dolson has been around and uh, really has been part of everything that's gotten IU to this point, both before and during uh, the pandemic. So uh, and and I guess with fewer sports, maybe has had more time to kind of prepare contingency plans for for what they're going to do uh so that's really you you know from an iu overall standpoint the the big news and as you said we certainly uh wish scott the best and and should be a smooth transition for somebody who's been around glass for so long and really from a basketball perspective um it seems like most everybody's on campus at this point i think christian lander is the only exception uh to that as of now so uh things continue to creep slowly forward to the what we hope will be a season uh, at some point but a lot of unknowns a lot of things will happen uh, between now and then but the guys getting uh, on campus and uh, and and starting some of the voluntary workouts those those kinds of things uh, in the near future will uh, you know hopefully hopefully will be a good uh, a good sign of what's to come and, and what we all hope will be a uh, an actual football season an actual basketball season all those kinds of things and uh, we'll just kind of see how it goes from there And to my right, he is the proud owner of one of the most incredible collections of IU memorabilia in the world. And if you look close, you can see some of it uh, behind Chris Williams, a.k.a. IU Artifacts. Chris, how are you feeling about the IU offseason thus far? Well, it's, you know, it was a positive note when we heard that, uh, you know, none of the players that were staff had tested positive uh, a little over a week ago. Hoping that trend continues. Uh, it'll be kind of interesting to see how the pandemic affects, obviously, not only IU, but all the teams in terms of off-season development. Um, cautiously optimistic about the season, but, um, you know, I've, there's been a lot of different uh, scenarios thrown around about what could happen with college basketball this year, really, you know, with college football. But, you know, one of the more interesting things I heard that's been kind of thrown around, and, I, and Rick Patino was one that tweeted about it, was, 
just having an in-conference season where you're only playing conference foes and you're starting in January. Um, it was an interesting thing, but I think overall there's so many variables that are at play that we don't know what's going to happen. Um, and I think that we can just hope for the best. And I know that, um, you, you know, the athletic department's writing their medical staff first and foremost on making decisions that are going to affect not only this, all athletes in all sports, but obviously with basketball. Um, but uh, we'll see where it goes. I mean, the, the fact that everybody's here, the fact that, you know, I know Lander's coming soon, but the fact that everybody's here and they're starting the development, preparing for the season is is exciting. And uh, hopefully we'll be, we'll be in assembly hall to some capacity this season. We can, we can hope that we get back there as soon as possible. And, uh, you know, controversial or not, we can do our part by wearing masks uh, when we can't social distance. So consider that uh, one for health uh, and the second uh, to maybe get the, the sports that we love back uh, as quickly as possible. So here's what we're going to talk about this week. Uh, there's a few Hoosier headlines. The main uh, segment will be our Jerome Hunter player preview, and then we'll end uh, this episode with uh, your questions, all that coming up this week on the Assembly Call Radio. Uh, but before we get to all of that, uh, a quick announcement. Please continue to support our friends at Homefield at homefieldapparel.com um, backslash assembly20. Uh, you, you could use that as a promo code. Uh, they, they do really great work, and they got some good news coming uh, the next 15 Saturdays. I, I think if I read the, the Twitter feed right, they're, they're coming up with some new designs. So after we buy all the IU gear, because that's priority number one, then if you want to stretch out and buy some additional shirts uh, that they are creating, go to homefieldapparel.com. They've been big supporters of ours. So the Hoosier headlines, uh, we, we talked a lot about Fred Glass serving his last day at AD. We wish him a lot of luck, as, as mentioned. He sent an email to the student-athletes that uh, participation in these uh, workouts this summer are voluntary, uh, but you'll keep your scholarship if you uh, choose not to participate in, ath- in athletics. And, again, I think that's the overall message uh, at Indiana, again, is taking care of the student athlete. We all want wins and we all want uh, the best coaches and the best players, but, you know, Indiana likes to do things right. And I think that's a, an example of doing that. I don't think that many uh, players will uh, choose to do that. And then the guys, uh, as Chris mentioned, are, and Andy mentioned, are back on campus except for uh, Christian Lander. So, uh, Andy, anything in particular with the, the headlines uh, that, um, that you want to address? I mean, I think the the Fred Glass email to to students about participation being voluntary, I think that puts a, a pretty good bow on his his tenure at IU and some of the things that uh, that he really advocated for and stood for while he was there. Uh, I think it's a it's a positive message that's out there. Uh, to your point, I don't know how many people will opt against it, but um, as you're seeing people, whether it be in the NBA or or Major League Baseball, make decisions for themselves and something they're getting paid for. Uh, you certainly feel good that you know college students who aren't getting paid are, are being afforded the same opportunity. Um, I, I do think you know, to to go back to the Rick Pitino thing, it, you know, it would be interesting or or how you back up the season or, or things like that. I think one one of the one of the pieces of that that becomes difficult is all the buy games and things like that. We can kind of complain about those as as fans for in a lot of ways, but those are such huge money makers for small conference schools. Uh, that funds so much of their programs just by taking on those games. So eliminating those has probably less ramifications for a big school than it does for a small one. And it'll be interesting to see, you know, when the when or if the NCAA would step in and say, hey, these are the things that we want to do. We're going to try to preserve and help out the little guy as opposed to, you know, letting the Power Five schools kind of do what they want. I think that becomes a a delicate balance, and it, it, again, one of those things that. Uh, you know, it's a business, whether anybody wants to really admit that or not, there's a lot of economics behind the decisions that they have to make. And so um, it, it's just that balance of, of how we're going to come out. And I know when, when Ryan was on a couple weeks ago, last time I was on, it was the same thing. It's like, it's going to become really apparent where the overall student athlete welfare falls in line with economic welfare and all those kinds of different things of, of decisions that, that people have to make, but, you know, starting things later could allow you to, you know, maybe kick the can down the road a little bit before you got to make those decisions. And, and that part might be uh, an interesting way to go, but uh, yeah, a lot of, a lot of moving pieces. I, I do not, uh, I do not wish to be in the position of some of these administrators of schools and, and the NCAA and things like that, having to try to make decisions or give guidance with uh, a fairly limited set of information. 
Yeah, you know, Scott Dolson's got his hands full uh, with with all kinds of uh, issues coming up, and and I think you know we're going to start seeing some answers here in the next four or five weeks. Uh, you know, school's starting up in a month in, in a lot of places in Indiana. Uh, high school sports are, and you're starting to see leaks of, you know, pushing back basketball till January. Uh, this week we started to see leaks about maybe playing football in in the spring. Uh, you know, so uh, this thing is, is always fluid and, and none of us have, have all the answers. I know I don't have the answers. Uh, I just would like to see it back at some point so that it's not an empty season for the athletes and the coaches. Uh, I will say this, you know, uh, being, being a Cubs fan, the, the pitching coach uh, had COVID-19 for 30 days and had a really tough uh, a, a week um, where he was almost hospitalized. It actually was for, for eight hours and was able to, um, to avoid being on a ventilator. So one of the things that is not discussed a lot, you know, the young people seem not to have as many complications with COVID, but there are a lot of coaches and this guy's in his thirties, 38, 40, uh, something like that. He's not an elderly, uh, pitching coach. So as those things start being decided, we'll, we'll start having a better idea. It's just, I think important for, if we can do it, uh, we, we need to do it because, um, Boy, it's been it's been a long road since we've had college athletics. Chris, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, there's just there's so much we we're just not really prepared for, and I think that no matter what you know actions are going to be taken, regardless of what the level is. I mean, you see what's happening in Michigan with high school athletics, where they're pushing everything to the spring and they're going to try to double up things. Um, you know, Andy brought up a good point about, you know, what are the ramifications for how COVID affects a Power Five conference to where they're not playing, you know, a Sun Belt or a Southern Conference or something like 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 my brother in law just got a new job coaching in a Southern Conference team and 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 you know they're they're going to be a program that depends on going and playing at a big Power Five school to raise money. How's that affect their athletic budget? I mean, Indiana's talked about the fact that they're going to be 10 million in the hole already, and they're going to try to adjust how they can and not have to cut sports. But what happens as the domino effect continues, you know, what happens if football is delayed? What happens if football is canceled? You know, there's just so many things, there's so many variables that we don't know about and that we're not in control of. And, and, you know, there's, you know, I think that to a larger extent, I wouldn't be surprised to see things pushed to the spring, but if is that going to be enough? I don't know. I mean, uh, I think we all want sports back. We all want it to be back to some level of normalcy, but I think we have to go beyond what um, our, you know, and, and we've talked already about the masks and, and thinking beyond your own scope and, and, you know, and thinking about others in those certain, certain situations. I just think that to me, um, you know, there's a, so many, so many things uncertain. Would, would a conference season be enough? Would, would that even be possible still under the circumstances? I mean, geographically with the big 10, you know, it's not as a tight knit travel area as it used to be, obviously with the co- the teams on the East coast, there's just so many things in play. And I think that hopefully we get some more, an- we get some answers um, in the next couple of weeks. I think it's really going to be indicative to see how many programs are, are going to be dealt with tremendously high positive rates. I think that's going to have a big effect. And we've seen some programs that have had some, but um, that I think is just, you know, it could be just the very beginning and we, we could be in for a long haul, but we don't know. I think, you know, we have to accept, obviously, that there will be some people contracting COVID. I think the issue is we we don't want teams to have that big breakout because if you're in the middle of a season uh, and you have a big breakout, then what happens to the game that weekend? And, and then the other thing that's not talked about a lot is, yes, I think young people will uh, not have as many complications long but they will have some recovery issues. So it's not just the standard 10 day quarantine 14 and you're back to being a high level college athlete that, that depending on the severity of it, uh, there could be uh, some time to get back in shape. Um, but the two things, and I'll ask, uh, I'll say this uh, first. My son said this, could you imagine IU football at noon, getting in the parking lot at seven tailgating IU football at noon, IU baseball at four, and then IU basketball at eight, uh, or nine o'clock in the evening, that would be a, a, a trifecta. So while this is crazy and it's driving us sports fans, I, I appreciate my son Brent for being optimistic because that would be the ultimate tailgate triple header 
Uh, and again, as, as if it comes back, I'd rather have it when scheduled, um, starting up here in September. But if not, I'd at least like to have it all in the spring and just have an incredible spring if we're all healthy and back to a lot more normal times. And, and then, Andy, my thought was this. If it is the Rick Patino plan and you start in January and only have conference, what's that do for us bracketologists? You know, a, a, an 11-9 and nine Big Ten team might be yeah. good enough, but compared to someone else, that's going to be an interesting uh, dilemma to select teams for a tournament if, if you do go conference only. Yeah, that would be uh, that would be really tricky because you wouldn't have a great way to measure. You know, we we've talked the you know last year the Big Ten performed really well out of conference and it kind of was the rising tide that lifted all boats and and helped everybody. Now you don't have that. Some of those numbers that uh, you know you get into the net and some of those kinds of things that really are in some ways established by how you play in the non conference before you start beating up on on your own. Uh, yeah, that would definitely make it uh, definitely make it challenging as if it wasn't challenging enough already. But uh, yeah. I, We'll we'll see what happens if it if it comes to that. I think there's, you know, I, I just don't know. You could scale back some of the non conference uh, potentially. Uh, I just don't know that it would go away entirely. But a lot of a lot of time between now and then to to figure out what actually will happen. Okay, coming up, we are going to look ahead to Jerome Hunter's sophomore season, and we're just going to assume it's going to start in November. His potential has tantalized us for two seasons, but health issues and inconsistency have held him back. Is this the season Jerome breaks out? We'll discuss next. Stick with us. Hi, this is AJ Moye. What's the only thing better than upsetting Duke in the Sweet 16? Celebrating it with friends afterwards. Join Jared, Andy, Ryan, and Coach for the assembly call after every IU basketball game. Go Hoosiers! Welcome back to the assembly call. You can find all of our content at our website, assemblycall.com. And if you ever want to join the chat mob during our unedited live broadcast or watch those replays and see all the in-between banter segment or segment in between segment banter then check out our youtube channel youtube.com backslash assembly call i'm the coach brian tonsoni here with andy bottoms and chris williams aka iu artifacts and now the main segment of the show is talking a little bit about jerome hunter what he accomplished last season and uh what he uh can be expected to do this season for the Indiana Hoosiers. As uh, most of us know uh, who follow the Hoosiers, that Jerome uh, was a redshirt freshman uh, due to some serious leg injuries. So last year was his second year in Bloomington, but really his first year playing basketball as his freshman year, he he did not even practice. And I think in in some of the discussion that we'll have, you'll see uh, his performance last year kind of shows that he was rusty in some of the areas of the game coming back after a year off. But Jerome Hunter is thought to be a very talented player and a big part of Indiana's success. And Andy, we'll start with you. Uh, assess Jerome Hunter as far as uh, what, what you thought he was able to accomplish in his uh, freshman year. Yeah, I think the the hard part with him is that it's, you know, even when he was seven to sit out his freshman year, he was highly thought of um, the second highest rated recruit in that class, I believe. And, um, and so you kind of built up in your head what he was going to be. And I think last year, what you saw was a guy who, you know, looked like a guy who hadn't played competitive basketball for a, a full year. Um, and, and I think he showed moments at times of what he could do. And it was, uh, a good building block, good start for him. And now you spring forward, he was able to gradually play some more minutes over the course of the season. And so now you just have to to wonder what the next step is. Uh, it, it looked like in going through the the minutes log that it was clear they were trying not to play him much over twenty minutes. Uh, he only played over twenty one minutes three times, and those were that was over a, a four game span in the middle of, of conference day. So as you spin forward, one of the positive you know people wanted to spin as a positive out of Justin Smith leaving is oh this opens up more minutes for Drum Hunter. So you got to figure out how many of those minutes he can legitimately take. Uh, when you figure that Justin played the most minutes on the team last year. So, you know, that's, that's one question in, in terms of what he did well. Uh, and we can get into some of these other numbers later. I did look in, in synergy. He, he, he fared really well from a, uh, a spot up shooting standpoint, which I think is not all that 
uh, all that surprising. That was really what he did um, the most. Um, so if you look at his offensive possessions, um, you know, one of his most effective, at least when you look in the percentiles there was on spot ups, um, scored jump shots, 60 points on 60 possessions, which puts him in the 73rd percentile, uh, 51 of those 60 shots were threes, um, which I think checks out with what you, what you saw with him. And, uh, he fared really well on catch and shoot unguarded situations. So I think for a guy coming back from an injury like that, um, you wonder whether that was what he was comfortable with, whether that was what the staff was comfortable with him doing to kind of ease him back into things. And if he can build on that and add some of the other parts of his game that uh, he had showed in high school with the size, being able to post up and go inside a little bit, can he drive it a little bit more? Can he do some of those things? Those are the big questions. It was, was that what role they were restricting him to? Is that what physically he's restricted to? Um, or will an, a potential for an expanded role this year allow him to to blossom a little bit more and, and expand in this game? You know, it's interesting uh, whether that was the role designed for him or whether that's just he felt comfortable. But a lot of times when you take a year off, uh, when you come back, you're going to spend a lot of time just spot up shooting. Uh, and he still has room to grow there. I mean, he shot 36% in the Big Ten, but starting out the year, he did not shoot um, that well in in the non-conference. But I think one of the struggles can be when you're coming back is that play around the rim, that the post-up game, the drive. Uh, he was able to get some hustle points, um, you know, some putbacks, which was nice to see too, because that those are always free points, and I, that shows his hustle and his desire. I would really like to see him add that 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 dribble game, that bounce game. Uh, but his stats last year, that was his weakest part of his game. And that I think is probably just because he's got to get used to the speed of the game without practicing that whole year. It's not a red shirt year where you get to practice and learn that speed. Uh, but it was good to see that when shots were available uh, on, on the spot up game, but he wasn't very good coming off screens either. I, I don't have the stats right now in front of me, but those are things that he's got to learn to get major, major minutes. Uh, Chris, do you do you think the that the injury, the leg thing, will still be an issue with his playing time, and then therefore with his stats again this year? And is that going to be a gradual increase his four years um, of playing basketball? I could realistically see this being an uh, issue for him for a long time, and I think I don't think that Artsy or the staff want to just throw him in the mix because of the opportunity. Obviously there's a huge opportunity with Justin not being here as you, as you, as you've said to where Jerome could, this could be the breakout year, but it really is all going to be if there, if there are limitations on setbacks with his leg situation. And, and again, you know, there is some knowledge about what's going on, but there's a lot that we don't know behind the scenes to where, um, you know, the treatment that he could be dealing with each and every day, just to be able to play, you know, 14 minutes a game, which is what we averaged last season. So I I think that, that we should hopefully be cautiously optimistic about um, him increasing his play. And I think that he'll get his wind, you know, obviously we've talked about his defense kind of being his, one of his big setbacks this year and Archie, you know, as he should came to his defense and said, you know, we're dealing with a true freshman. This is not a situation where race sits out a year and develops into the, uh, into the system and knows how to play. And, and, you know, this is someone who largely was on the sideline. and could do very little. So I think that we're just beginning to see the, the, the start of what could be a very blossoming career, but we have to take that with a grain of salt to where we can't be shocked if he's only playing 20 minutes a game and he's not starting consistently. And, He's going to have his up and down games. He's going to have those situations where he very well may go again, you know, 10 straight games without hitting a three and then come in like he did against Penn State and then in the Illinois game and hit a clutch shot where he needs to, especially a three, which was extremely, you know, you know, welcoming from, you know, you know, as a, as a fan, that was great to see. And I think that that was part of the Jerome Hunter we were anticipating and what we were hearing about, but I'll go into it cautious because, you know, you hear things, about he's progressing, but this is not going to be a night and day scenario where you could push him to the brink like Trace and play him 39 minutes a game. I just don't see that happening, but I, I want to be proven wrong. Yeah, I, th- I think the other thing when you, you start, you know, what you guys had, had talked about with him and, and you know, it's a it's a leg situation. He He's not a guy who gets a ton of lift on his jumper, um, which I think is fine. Shoots it with confidence, really was, even when he was missing, you know, his form looks good. He was just long on, on a lot of stuff. It seemed like early 
and then seem to dial that back. The, the other area that manifests itself a little bit is being able to, to finish around the rim as we talked about that stuff. And so, you know, one of the other numbers is two point shooting percentage overall was not, um, you know, was only a little bit over 40, 42%, but in big 10 play, he was seven of 22 on twos. And then the way that Ken Palm does it against tier a competition, he was five of 15 tier a and B he was eight out of 20. So it struggled to finish inside. Some of that is just being able to get, I think the lift that he may have been accustomed to. And I think that's why this season becomes important because you start to see like how much is the jump? I think is, as you guys both said, you'll see progression in some way from a health perspective as he gets more used to dealing with his situation and things like that. But um, if it's a small incremental jump, then you're probably going to get small incremental jumps from there. If you get a bigger jump um, and he, and he starts to look more like the guy that he, he was in high school and doing some of those things, then um, I, I think you get really excited about it. But even if he really dials it in, continues to improve his three point shot, he can be valuable on the team as a floor spacer. It just is a matter of everybody who's projecting great things for the team with Justin Smith gone and all those kinds of things is counting a lot on Jerome Hunter taking a big jump from where he was last year as to maybe just a incremental jump as he gets healthier and, um, you know, gets closer to what he was. So that's really a big question mark that none of us are in any position to answer, but it'll, uh, it'll, it'll go a long way toward deciding, you know, kind of how the season swings for IU one way or the other. Andy, you mentioned confidence. Uh, we, we saw that last year, you know, he wasn't very hesitant to shoot and he would shoot as soon as he, he came in. And in the clip that, that we saw on uh, social media, I like to see the clips of the guys playing. It, it was, uh, you know, in the church and, you don't know what the competition was or how intense the play was, but he did look like he was playing smooth and fluid uh, and, and looking for shots. And that has to translate to the college practice floor and the college game when you're being scouted. And that's a whole different thing than just summer pickup. But at least he was being able to to take shots uh, and some spin moves. He struggled, in the stats that you shared in, in our run sheet, he struggled both offensively and defensively on the move. Uh now he did he did have some good stats coming off the the pick and roll I believe if I, I saw those stats right, but getting to the rim uh, and, and the post those are things that he he can get some more points and help this team more score more by just making that average uh, from those that were were weak. He also struggled guarding the bounce and that is something that he's got again got to find that speed. That's a freshman thing and that's a freshman. Also a freshman thing with a, a guy who is trying to figure out his body after taking a year off. And, you know, we, we all want Jerome Hunter to be the Jerome Hunter that we believe he can be immediately. That had to be a mental thing as well, coming back with as serious as injury as it was, uh, of taking hits and, and being able to move laterally. So he's got to be able to move better with the basketball. He's going to have to be better to move his feet defensively, especially guarding threes that can really attack the rim in order to get more minutes. I think that's the that's the desire for me for Jerome Hunter. But when you have a guy with an attitude, a scorer's mentality, and I think Jerome has a scorer's mentality, uh, and and hopefully in a, a one within the scope of the offense, not a heat check one like we've seen from some players uh, that have donned the uniform recently, but He's, you know, you, you you miss all the shots you don't take. So he has to come in and, and be aggressive. But I do think we need to be cautious, as Chris said, with what does that mean? You know, he got 14 minutes in, in the Big Ten, 13-something overall. I do see that pushing 20. And if he's healthy and if he's playing well, that could go above 20. But we also have some depth. And one thing I want to ask you guys about is rhythm. One of the things... Um, that I think is really hard to understand is when players get eight to 14 minutes, it's hard to get into a rhythm to have effective field goal percentage. We all want the subs to shoot 45% from three and we want them to shoot 50 from two, uh, but they're coming into the game and there are different scenarios. And so you don't get into the flow as much. And, you know, I think 20 minutes or above gets a player into the flow. You're playing 10 minutes a half at least. So if he's healthy and can play that, I think you'll see those stats go up simply from getting into a rhythm on game night. Chris, your thoughts about uh, his minutes and, and, and rhythm and his improvement? Yeah, I, I think if he if he is someone who is starting, and I think that if his health is where he wa- he wants it to be and where the coaching staff expects it to be hypothetically, I think you you see him starting 
realistically at the three, but you, you know, it, I think the starting position, if you, if you start him at the three, I think that that allows, you know, he didn't start any games this year. That was part of the thing, you know, as you mentioned, he didn't start any games at all. I mean, he appeared in, I think, I think almost every game, but 31. I, I, yeah, 31. So, you know, he, and I think that that was kind of designed by design. And we know that Archie doesn't really mess with starting lineups at all. He's made that very clear, regardless of how many games in a row race plays really well. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't start, but I think, I think if Jerome is given the, the green light to start, that could give him the ability to get into a rhythm right away. But you know, I don't know. I think we saw this year, we saw him, in scenarios where he came in and he wasn't being productive and Archie benched him. And then he came in and he would hit a clutch shot when he was needed and he stayed in the game to the brink of where he could play physically. So I think for him with Jerome, I think, I think he has the confidence. I think he's not afraid to shoot. I think he's been given the, you know, the green light, as they say it to, to be someone to go in and, and, and be offensively aggressive. But to me, I think for a lot, for him, he's hungry to, to crack the starting lineup and he wants to be in that position if his health is right, you know, to be in that, that three position where he is going to be the offensive scorer to kind of counter, you know, balance what, what Trace is going to do. And, you know, you know it's, it'll be interesting to see how that dynamic is in with Trace and with Christian. If, if Christian, you know, comes in and whatever his, you know, he may not start obviously with, with, with Rob, if, if Rob's healthy and all that, but I just think that there's so many dynamics with this team going in. There's so many lineups that you could put in realistically. I, I want to see Jerome on the floor as much as possible in that, because I think he brings so much to it athletically, you know, and I think that, he's going to get his steps going to get quicker on defense, but I I think that confidence is going to be there, but I think, you know, he needs to be in that position where if he's given the the green light to be the starter, he's got to embrace that and, and take it on and take it full on. Andy, do you uh, foresee a, a scenario where he's not a starter? And if he is not a starter, can he still have the 20 minutes and major impact on the Indiana basketball program? Or do you think he's, uh, going to unless something happens automatically be be in that starting lineup yeah it's it's tough to say i mean it depends a little bit you know some of the other lineup combination conversations that have been had over the course of the uh over the course of the off season um you, you would think that he would i think that the scenario that maybe that doesn't happen is if lander really comes in and looks the part uh which you know, may not happen early in the season, but as you get further along, do you roll with a, a three guard situation with with Lander and Rob and Al, uh, and and bring Jerome in? There was some talk of using something like that, and then playing Jerome at the four. Um, so I, I don't. I think that the challenge for him becomes you, you mentioned the 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 rhythm component. It was interesting. I was looking back while you were you were talking about that. I mean, three of his five highest scoring games were the ones that that he played the most minutes in. Uh, where he was able to get into a little bit of rhythm, and th- they were good scoring games against a you know decent competition. You know, twelve points against Maryland, ten points against Purdue, nine points against Ohio State. You know, those were games that he played a lot, was able to potentially get into a little bit of a, a rhythm, um, helped on the boards in each of those games. And so, th- there's probably some truth to that. I think it's just as a matter of if you start him, how many minutes a game do you get out of him? I I, I would be hesitant to say he's going to be able to jump up and even give you thirty minutes a game. That that may feel like a stretch, but um, I think if he shoots it well and, and can move a little bit better, um, you know, than he did last year, I think there's every reason to put him in the starting lineup. He gives you offense. He gives you floor spacing. If he's knocking down threes, um, there's a lot of good things that he brings to the table on a team that at times has been offensively challenged. And, and I think that's why he was looked at so much, even the year that he was out is like, this is a guy who could you know put the ball in the basket uh, as a high school player. And, and you wanted to see some of that. And it was something the team needed. Um, and the other thing I, that I, I, I remembered as we were talking about him is he was a guy that Archie really talked about as rarely having been around somebody who loved basketball as much as Jerome did. And, and you think about, you know, having that essentially taken away from him for a year and some of that pressure he's putting on himself to come back and trying to make up for lost time. I think we joked about that in some of those early games and he scored a decent number of points in some of the early non-conference games. Cause it was just like, I'm back out here. I'm going to get some shots up. I'm going to, uh, and those games were good for, for him in that scenario, just to get his, his legs under him and, uh, and do some things like that. So yeah, I do think there's a, some truth to, you know, how much is he 
how much was he trying to make up for lost time versus, you know, this year, can he settle into an actual role that's going to be more consistent? And I think he, he almost has to, uh, if this team's going to be able to, you know, perform in the way that we all hope that they will. I'm with Chris. I want to see him on the floor as much as he possibly can be. I think he is a, a key component with, with his ability, but he's going to have to be able to guard because when he went in and didn't guard, you know, Archie doesn't have too much patience for that. And that's when his minutes got a little bit, uh, lower. And, and I think he'll figure that out. And I think he can be a good defender. My question is, can he be used at the four? Can he defend the four in situations where you want to go real small? But I can foresee uh, a situation where Jerome is heavily um, necessary for Indiana to be successful and yet still come off the bench. If you do go a three guard lineup with Rob and Lander, and then you have Durham as a senior who you want to honor as a starter. The other thing that you can do is monitor his minutes. You could probably get eight to nine minutes a half, and that's 16 to 18. And then if he's going hot, then you could play him down the stretch and get to his 20, 22 uh, minutes. And maybe that's an offensive boost to come in uh, against the team's uh, the opponent's substitution as well and give him an opportunity to to boost the offense there. So there's a scenario where he doesn't start, but Jerome's one of the better players. And uh, I would like to see him start personally as a fan, but I, I am bracing myself because of the health issue and the leg issue that you want Jerome Hunter for four years. Uh, you don't want him just for two years and, and, and use him when you have some other players, especially some freshmen coming in that can get some spot minutes behind him. Uh, as needed. Chris, do you see him just playing the three? Do you think he can play some four? And, and do you think that's a, a spot he can be successful in? Or, or are you concerned about him at the four? I'm still I'm concerned about him defensively. And that could very well be just the fact that he, you know, the limitations of minutes and the fact that he was a freshman last year, you know, you're going to see that even the best player is going to struggle defensively. I think stretch out, he could play the four. But my concern is that his the physicality of someone who who's a four could really just take advantage of that. I mean, there's a lot of really athletic, quick, big fours in the Big Ten that I could see Jerome struggling with. Um, but I could also see a situation where if he's physically capable – I, you could just run and gun somebody out of the building with that small lineup and him playing the four. So I think it's, it's possible. I'd like to see him kind of mold into that three more, but I wouldn't be surprised if Archie gets a little creative with the, with the lineups to see, to see that four position being a possibility and maybe Trey sliding over to the five. I don't know. I, or, you know, whatever the case may be, um, the big question mark for me is defense. And, and I think that, if you're if if you go against the wrong matchup in the wrong situation, your opponent's going to expo- you know they're going to take advantage of that, and that could be the big difference in the ball game. Yeah, I think that the defensive part of that is is interesting. On the one hand, I I think if you if you take the the non numbers approach to it, I would have some of the same concerns as you. Is does he does he struggle to keep guys off the glass? Some of the you know more explosive uh, athletically you know, fours in the league. The flip side of that is if you look at what he really struggled with last year, um, defensively, coach brought this up before, you know, he was, he was really poor on pick and roll ball handlers. So if you're guarding a four, are you going to get put in those situations where the four is the guy that ends up, you know, handling the ball coming off of a pick and roll that that's pretty unlikely. Uh, so maybe it, it helps minimize some of his deficiencies. What he did do well, um, last year was, you know, being able to, to get out on, on shooters. Um, I think some of that has to do with his length. Some of that could be luck. Um, you know, who, who really, who really knows, but it, it might be able to mask a little bit of what he struggled with defensively if he's not getting back more of his lateral quickness and things like that. But I think I tend to fall a little bit more on, yeah, maybe you could experiment with that a few minutes a game. Uh, if it works, if the situation dictates, I think it is a possibility if you felt like you needed to steal a few minutes here and there. Um, but I don't know that it's something they'd be able to really embrace for long periods of time uh, if you did that. I think that would be that would seem to suggest that your guard play is really strong if you feel like you, you're in a position to want to do that. So I guess maybe that that is the sign of a good problem to have. But um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't mind seeing it, experiment with it for a few minutes here and there. But I don't know that that's going to be something he's going to log a ton of minutes at 
during the course of the season by the time you figure the minutes that Joey, Race, and Trace are going to eat up at the four and the five, how many minutes are ultimately left uh, up there to even take if you wanted to do that. In the uh, manner of our friend Jay Horry, I, to end this segment, just a over-under question here, a couple of them real quick. Uh, over-under 20 minutes for Jerome. Chris? Over. Andy? Yeah, I'll def- I'll definitely take over on that one. I think he, I'd like to see him get in the 20. I think if you'd set it around like 25, I probably would have hesitated a little bit, but I think 20, I think that's a, a good bet to, to beat that. And, and that may be his max this year. We don't know, but that would be welcoming. Definitely. And 10 points or more on the season. Andy, you go first this time. Uh, I'm going to, I'll probably go under on that. Um, I think that he has the potential to do that, but I, I'm trying to be semi consistent with how I answered a, a scoring question a couple weeks ago. So I think I think it'd be under if I uh, if I'm remembering how I answered that one correctly. And Chris, I would say under two. I, I see him about eight points per game. That's I think that would be a, a huge. I mean, he was at three last year. I think eight would be a great jump. And if he gets higher than that, that would just be a welcome addition. But I think eight's realistic. I'm going to go over and over. Uh, and it just blows up my cautious approach to everyone. Like I, I claimed a few shows back that I'm going to be very cautious, but I think he's going to be right around 10. Uh, and, and I think he'll reach double figures because he'll hit two or, you know, a couple threes. And I think he'll have a couple breakout games at the 20. Uh, and I think he'll get a little run at the four, but mostly at the three. If he plays a lot of defense, I think those numbers are all going to go up. So that'll do it for our Jerome Hunter player pre- preview. Coming up in our third segment, we'll answer your questions, including one about building an IU-themed man cave. It's actually a mediocre question. Stick with us here on The Assembly Call. Zizloft, I never miss an open three, and I never miss an episode of The Assembly Call. Welcome back to The Assembly Call. I'm the coach Brian Tonsoni, here with Andy Bottoms and Chris Williams, a.k.a. IU Artifacts. Remember, you need to be subscribed to our email newsletter. We send out a weekly IU News Roundup even during the offseason and after every game. We send out a detailed post-game analysis. Just text IU to 66866 or go to assemblycall.com. That's IU to 66866 or go to assemblycall.com. It's now time for our mailbag. All questions were submitted via our our private IU basketball discussion community at assemblycall.com backslash community. And our first question is a mediocre one. It's not that good, but it's not that bad. It's Jay's Mediocre Question. Jay asks, uh, let's say you're building an IU-themed basement or bar. What IU memorabilia, lore, picture, etc. would be the centerpiece of your project? You only get to choose one piece, picture, etc. And we'll send it to the guru of artifacts, Chris Williams. Yeah, I, for some reason, struggled with this. Um, to me, it's going to have to be like a game used jersey. Like if you could get a Calvert Cheney game used jersey or a Scott May game used game used jersey, I think that would be an obvious one. But I think one picture. I, I like the picture. I'm going to go the picture path. There, the best photo I've ever seen at IU basketball is the '76 team. Uh, it's the black and white photo. They're all in their their suits and their trench coats, and it looks like Quinn Buckner is holding a, a like a screwdriver about to kick somebody's ass. That's my. That would be like a big panel like on your wall that just screams like cool and that would be an amazing talking point if you could so that would be my pick man i can't i can't believe you said that i had i have that picture pulled up because that's what i was that's what i was going to say from 1975 walking through new york uh december of 1975 where they were uh, walking through there yeah i think that would be a good one just from a, a badass perspective i would be i would be remiss uh, if Jared were here, he would, uh, without a doubt, say the Cheney needs one sign. So um, it's right we'll, up there. Yeah, we'll throw we'll throw that one 
uh, we'll throw that one in there as well. But yeah, if it was if it was something player related, it would be uh, it would be a, a something with Calvert for me. I've tried to find that photo. It's an AP photo, and you have to order it through them, and they want like one hundred fifty dollars. And I said, fine, I will pay one hundred fifty dollars. And I I've, I've emailed them like five times, and they won't get back to me because I want to get a copy of that photo. Yeah, but, yeah. Jared wants the actual. I said been in record many times. He wants the actual sign. Yeah, uh, I, I, is, I mean, I'm talking about the yeah. seventy, the seventy six one. Oh, yeah, the seventy six one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be crazy. Oh, that'd be a good time to point out. And then, uh, Coach, I'll let you jump in. Uh, Chris has started a new video series, so he had the first one up uh, this week, kind of going through some of his pieces of memorabilia. So, would encourage everybody to uh, go to IU Artifacts on Twitter, and the, the link to the first one is up there. So, looking forward to what uh, what other stuff will go. I think if he did it. A, not that you're doing it every day, but I think if you did it every day, I'm not sure how many years you'd go before you ran out, but, uh, you know, just something to think two about. to three days a week is what I'm thinking. Just so I don't kill myself, but yeah, it's, go. it's going to be nice. It'll be exciting. I, I would do the, uh, Colin Hartman game worn shorts that, uh, somehow appeared in my basement would be my centerpiece. Uh, no, I would do a, a game worn Jersey, maybe on a mannequin, you know, like I, I know my buddy has down there in the basement. Um, the other picture that I might do is the uh, 87 championship with Alford and the guys with the, the fist raised after the championship. But you need a good picture, and you need several pieces of uh, memorabilia. I can't wait to get down to IU Artifacts' basement. He's He built a new house, and you can see the background. Uh, he kind of gave me a tour uh, a little bit ahead of time. Uh, it's just a fantastic place, and, and I appreciate uh, what, what Chris does. So, so that's um, the mediocre question. Jay... Um, from Twitter, uh, just the letter J, known at Big Red Machine Twitter handle. I hope we got that right. His question is, what is everyone's favorite niche feature of Assembly Hall? His was when the banners start to sway when the noise is amped up at Assembly Hall. Guys, your thoughts on the uh, the favorite niche of Assembly Hall? Chris? Uh, it's weird, but when you enter Assembly Hall on the south side, which was the entrance we used to go in for years, You'd open the exterior door and this be this huge hit of air hitting you in the face every time. That to me gave me chills from the very first game I was there, and it still gives me chills every single time. And I don't know what it's just the way that the HVAC in the building works. And I don't know if it's still as potent now because they've redesigned stuff, but that to me is still the coolest thing. It's a very strange thing. It's not like the you know the the banners. It's not about the you know the fact that you're sitting almost on top of the players. That to me is still the most interesting and kind of uh, you know abnormally absurd thing about assembly hall but i love it and like i said i look forward to it every single time i go in there i i didn't come up with a great answer to this one immediately i don't know that this was somewhat a sign of of maybe a a, a not great feature of the place but um before they had changed out the scoreboards and and if you sat in the last couple rows of the main level, which I had tickets for as at times as a student, you couldn't actually see the scoreboard. And so if one of the games, we were really close to the wall and you could see where people had taken like a pen or something and were essentially keeping score on the wall of the game to keep track of what was going on. So uh, not, not coming from a great place in terms of, uh, of aesthetics, but it was just something that I remember about that, which is no longer an issue given the scoreboard and everything else, but uh, uh, just kind of a weird, a quote unquote feature of it, I guess. For, for me, in in facilities I like, it's walking through the tunnels to get your first sight of the court or the or the baseball field. So, you know, walking through, uh, it's tight. You see the ushers there, and then you take the step down, hopefully instead of up. Um, but then you see that court and that white centerpiece of Assembly Hall, the state of Indiana, is 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 really good. We have uh, real quick, uh, Chad Schwartzkopf. We got about maybe 30 seconds each, which IU basketball alumni would you like to address the team real quick, Chris? I like the suggestion of Eric Gordon relevancy doing great things in the NBA. He loves the fact that he played in Indiana. He's a true Hoosier and he would let the players know what it means to play for the the team on the uniform. And Andy. Yeah. I, yeah, I think from a relevancy standpoint, that would be a good one. Um, I mean, anytime you can have some of the 76 guys come back, though, I think that would be good. A Quinn Buckner, somebody like that. That's it. We're done. No more questions. Well, that'll do it for this week's episode of the Assembly Call. If you want to see us do the show live, join us at assemblycall.com on Thursday nights for the live broadcast of our Assembly Call radio recording. And don't forget to go to assemblycall.com or text IU to 66866 to join our free email newsletter. Special thanks to 
Thanks to Bob Thompson for producing most of the music you hear on the show. And thank you for listening. We'll talk to you again next Thursday night. Until then. Take it from me, Jordan Halls. Keep your elbow in and your eyes on the rim. And go Hoosiers. Thank everybody for coming out. All right. I got to get out of here, folks. Thank you. And that's a wrap. And just as it came to a close, there's uh, people are shooting off fireworks here outside of my house. So <laughs> must have been pleased with how things went. <laughs> Joel's mentioning a Chuck Crab is is obviously a good one. You know, yes. When he uh, says Ohio yeah. and Iowa, I mean, I just I sophomore sophomore. sophomore. I just, you beat me to that. Maria Ohio. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, he's the man. I hope he does it for another fifty years. Yeah, the way he said, who was it when I was there? I think Luke Jimenez, the way he would say, he would, oh. Luke Jimenez. Or, yeah. it, there was some way he said it that was unique. It was it was fun. Yeah. Sophomore. Yeah, that was just too good. <laughs> so the other question that we had was about, um, I'm not really up on all the recruits. I know that um, they're, the current uh, recruits, we have Kaufman, who um, – is a big push for Indiana, and he's been interviewed on several of the media sites, uh, and his recruitment is still looking pretty good for Indiana, not solid. He's getting some recruits from Virginia or some um, love from Virginia, North Carolina. Uh, Wesley from South Bend, um, the Miller kid, and Muhammad are the top four probably targets for IU in 2021. Uh, today, Justice Williams, a five-star 6'3 guard from Philadelphia, who will be playing at Mount Verde uh, Prep in Florida, uh, received an offer, and it looks like Archie's going for a lot of uh, national-type solid players. Uh, A.J. Casey is a five-star that has received um, an offer, and Sky Clark is a guard. A.J. Casey is a forward. And then a couple Indiana, State of Indiana 2022, Jalen Washington, I believe, is coming off an injury. He's a 6'8 forward. And... um, Deontay Davis, uh, whose brother, I believe, is playing at Louisville or, or going to Louisville. His dad is now the coach at Warren Central. Uh, those are the two Indiana offers uh, that I could find. And there's a point guard, Bruce Thornton. Um, there's a conversation, I think, on Inside the Hall today with Bruce Thornton. I haven't had a chance to read that yet. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about who I would prefer on that. I, I trust Archie to uh, – it seems like Archie likes to get in on some top talent – uh, in case they want to come here to uh, sprinkle in with those get old guys and those Indiana guys. Uh, and it looks like uh, right now there's a a player at every position, point guard, small forward, power forward, center, Sean Phillips from the Dayton area. Watch that from Dayton's uh, Archie's days at Dayton and uh, Sky Clark, uh, uh, which is a combo guard. So it looks like everything, there's no particular position that Archie's looking for in 2022. And, um, no real word on Kaufman, Wesley, uh, those guys, um, when when they choose to, to make a decision. I imagine it'll be closer to November, um, if if not later. Any thoughts, you guys, anything that you've heard? or I, I think Kaufman's the one that I would be surprised, even with some blue chip offers, that I would be shocked if he doesn't come here. I've just heard so much about the relationship that he has with Archie and with, with, uh, with Ostrom. That and he just you know he gets along so well with Leal and and Lander and and Galloway and those guys. And he plays with Duncan. They're, they're yeah, on the same yeah. team. In I, I just think you know they, they those guys always they always downplay the oh you know yeah you know we're buddies but we're gonna kind of you know we want to do our own thing and go down our own our own path and a lot of times those paths seem to go in the same direction. So I would be very surprised if Trey does not come here. Um, but that's the strongest indicator I've heard just because Indiana has been in from the very get go and they've shown that they want him bad. So, you know, I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised at all, but who knows? I've been pleasantly surprised that the Wesley uh, recruit is still going on. I was concerned that that might drop off a little bit, especially with, you know, South Bend and, you know, I know nothing, but you put these together as a know nothing fan from afar that Demisey was from up there that, you know, not a bad report from Demisey, but here's a kid from South Bend went down to Indiana, didn't get any run. Um, even though each recruitment is, is individual, but it seems like he's sticking around and there's no guarantee that he's going to come to IU. I think Miller or Kaufman will be in an in Indiana uniform. 
I think Kaufman first, but if he doesn't come, then then Miller uh, six nine coaches. You know the dad played. The Miller Florida thing's and, intriguing. Yeah, That's I don't really know intriguing. if they can both play. That was a question someone asked at some point. Can they both play? Are they both power forwards, or can one slide? That's that's so too the small forward. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I think they're two of the same. But the, you know that whole thing with Miller leaving, you know, stepping down and all that. I, I that just threw a whole new scenario into his rec- and you know his boys' recruitment. But I I don't know. I think I would rather have Kaufman over Miller. But I mean, I've seen Mil- the highlight reels from Mi- for Miller. Holy moly, that boy can play. I mean, he's. <laughs> really good they're both really good it's just going to be hard from afar uh, again i usually start paying attention when it gets close to november and 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 those things or when someone's down to the final three archie's been in a lot of finals uh, and he's not necessarily getting them the big kid from milwaukee didn't get and and then this kid who went to villanova patterson he didn't get but he must be doing a good job to get these kids from philadelphia and, and out of state who are five stars to to at least get indiana to the top three and not be dismissed early so you know, Isn't I don't Bruiser think, the one that's mainly handling East Coast? Probably. Still, is that, yeah. I would imagine so. Yeah. Yeah. And I know nothing about 2022. I know the Jalen Washington guy, I think, had a knee sur- knee injury uh, this season um, from Gary West. Um, and I know that the, the young man's, uh, the Davis guy, his dad was at, uh, he played at Lawrence Central for two years, and then his dad got the head coaching job at Warren Central. So he'll be playing at Warren Central next year, and he does have a brother or family member that just got recruited to Louisville, and I don't know if that's going to be a an issue or not. And I don't know any of the other twenty twenty two Indiana. Yeah, I was say that's that's too far out. That's too far out for me. I uh, I heard somebody give the analogy once: that as you get older, it's like the things you're interested in is like a, or that you have time for is like a bonsai tree and you gradually like pair it back. I think recruiting has, has been one that I've, I've paired back over the course of time. So that's a good way of describing it. Absolutely. I forget what, I forget what context it was given in, but I was like, yeah, that is a, that definitely is an apt one where you can only find time for so many other things. And there's some things that got to go. And that, that definitely one's that far out or too hard to speculate. I try to keep up on more of the ones that are at least potentially imminent, for, for something to happen, but I would, I would echo what you guys said about those. Yeah. My interest in, in exercising has fallen off the bonsai tree. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Uh, Tyler Asher in the chat mob says CJ Gunn is a name to watch uh, from Indiana. And for everyone listening, they are starting up. They have been playing the last couple of weeks. Coaches aren't allowed to go. They are doing some live streaming. I don't know if that's a, a free thing or a purchase thing but if you are unlike andy and i and want to really watch recruiting you can tune into an aau game on your computer um that sounds exercising sounds a little more exciting to me than watching an aau game but that's just from a high school basketball coach What else? Do we have anything else on there? I know Valerie had something about um, the injury. It seems like she mentioned something about how um, there seems to be a lot more issues um, with young people that are similar to what uh, Jerome and Duran have gone through. So thanks, Valerie, for sending that in. Yeah, I haven't. uh, I didn't. I haven't listened to the hysterics interview with Duran this week. Have either of you guys had a chance to? I have not. Yeah, I, was say, I haven't. I haven't either. Without either. traveling anywhere, so, one, my job is when I do go to work, it's thirty seconds from my house. I don't have any drive time. <laughs> I guess I could listen because I'm not doing much in staying at home and not going out and doing things. You can listen for three hours now, but I, I haven't found. I listened to Coach Roberts one, of course. <laughs> as as you'd expect. As you'd expect. <laughs> Ball pressure, yes. ball pressure, ball pressure. <laughs> Man, I, I went back, and I, I'm doing these Coach's Corners videos for our community every Tuesday, and I'm watching games on television. I can hear him on the broadcast yelling out stuff. I love it when him and Bruiser get into it. They're, like, arguing about something, and 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 it's it's great you know, and it's just they're fiery they're both yeah. fiery guys they're all fiery i mean ostrom seems to be the most level-headed of the group you know that uh, it's 
you, you got to know the coaching dynamics too, because I think I get told to shut up at least twice a game from my head coach. And we are, we are real tight and real close. And then behind the scenes, when we start game planning and I say something and then he's, and I, he, he'll say, Hey, I think we need to do this. I said, okay, we're going to give up 80 tonight or we're going to give up 80 <laughs> this week. Well, what do you want to do? You know, and then some of the other uh, young coaches that are in there are watching us to go back and forth and they're not sure what to think, but it's just, uh, if the dynamics are strong, you'll see, you'll see that, um, a lot. So I'm not pushing the envelope enough if I don't get told to shut up from my head coach. <laughs> I also got told, this is a great story. I got told to shut up by official in the sectional championship game. He personally came over, put his arm on me and said, you need to sit down or I'm going to tee you up. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and I, I, I was too excited. <laughs> you got to know your role. Yeah. I Yeah. Yeah. Are we tackling uh Oh, Sammy's, Sammy's question. Thing, or are we just going to let it go? It doesn't matter. I, I I said my piece at the beginning. I said a, a little piece if anyone wants to throw things. I think we need to wear masks. And I don't think, the, you know, I know it's a political and controversial issue for some and, and everyone's allowed to their opinion, but I want healthy people number 1, and then I want sports. And this thing obviously is rearing itself back and if masks can at least stop some of it, um, I, I'm all for it. Um, they just they just passed something today. The Monroe County Public Health Board, is, uh, our governor here in Indiana, made a you know we're kind of in holding pattern, but it says all businesses are required to post a sign at the main entrance by July 8th of this year that requests patrons wear a face covering while on the premises in order to protect employees, other customers, and those with whom they are in contact. So it's kind of an interesting thing because if we're going to get to something where it's mandated or not, um, you know, because I, I heard whispers that Marion County has already, or they're going to be doing that soon where they're going to be mandating it. I don't know if that's accurate or not. I, I haven't, I don't live in Marion County, obviously, but um, I, I'm at the I point know. guys where it's I'm courtesy. Not, I don't want to get into a long discussion and I don't want to sure. get into a long argument with anyone because it's just like everything else. It's siloed, you know, one way or the other, but I'm just sharing my story. Sure. I, I wear a mask so that I can coach. And when I go back yeah. to coach uh, 630 on June 8th, for the first time seeing my guys since March 12th, I'm required by Western to wear a mask. And it'll be difficult um, to coach in a mask, but I'd rather coach those guys in a mask than sit in my basement and not coach. I wear a mask for my students. I, and not necessarily my students, but I think they'll be okay. But I, their parents and their grandparents, as they go home for the weekends, um, I do not want to be a spreader of this disease if I happen to get it. And I wear a mask for my mom. And then all behind that, I wear a mask for us to be able to see sports again, which is just a huge part of my life. I know that's a lot less than health, but I don't wear it for myself and I don't wear it because I'm scared and I don't wear it because I'm fearful of it. In fact, I think I had COVID. Um, and so, uh, I just don't have an antibody test or anything else like that. I think I had 18 days of no taste and smell. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure I had it, um, but it, I might be able to get it again or asymptomatic. I care about others. And if anyone wants sure. to call me soft, um, I'll give out my phone number and you can call me soft for wearing a mask. But I care about my kids. I care about my players. I care about the health of society and I care about sports and I'll wear a mask all day. I, yeah, I won't wear a Purdue mask, but I'll wear any It's other a courtesy. Mask. It's a courtesy. <laughs> and I'm in the same position because I want to be as a teacher, I want to be back in the classroom. I want to be you with know, my they, kids. Yeah. They, they, you know, the, the, all these board pediatrics have said that kids need to be in the classroom because socially and emotionally they're in a rut and that rut's just going to make it harder for them developmentally. I mean, I have two kids that are, gonna, are in elementary school. One's going to be a kindergartner and I'll tell you what, bless that kindergarten teacher who has to try to keep the masks on kids all day. But you know what? It's just something you have to roll with. And I think too often, we're not just considerate of other people, you know, we're too, you know, and this is my opinion. I think sometimes we get too stuck on our own agenda and we don't think about others. You know, my grandmother's 93, she's in a nursing home and I want to be able to see her. Yep. You know, you know, obviously the nursing homes have been battered in the state and across the country. And we, you know, we just had five, five deaths in the last couple of weeks in this County. I, I just don't, 
you know, I'm going to, I have not gone anywhere without wearing a mask because I don't th- see what's the big deal about it. I don't see why it's such a big deal to just wear a mask. I, I, you know, I don't, but by the I, way, I, I'll let Andy answer, but we did get a question sure. um, from Sammy Jacobs. Why is it difficult to, uh, in, about the mask? That's why we're addressing it here. Um, go ahead, Andy. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I fall along the same lines as, as you guys. I mean, for the handful of things that I'm going out and doing here, like it's not an inconvenience to, to me to do it. So why not do it? I mean, we can get into arguments about, Oh, it doesn't help. But the, like, to me, it, it it's not making it worse. So if it, you know, there's all those things going around. Like if the worst case scenario is that it doesn't do anything other than inconvenience you for a few minutes. And so what, um, and, you know, we, we went on vacation last week, so we drove down to North Carolina and we would, you know, every time we would, you know, stop at a rest stop, we'd put our masks on and go in and you saw different people doing different things and, um, you know, picked up food a couple of times where we were in North Carolina. We didn't ever go sit and eat anywhere, um, you know, picked up our groceries online, did whatever, tried to just do as much as we could to just needed a change of scenery. We'll kind of hang out together here. People were considered on the beach where they weren't on top of there and, and doing whatever. And it like, I didn't have any worse of a time. I didn't have any struggles doing it. And, um, to me it's, yeah, you're, you're thinking about other people and it just, it's just kind of funny. Cause you'll sit and kind of watch different, you know, people go in and out of places and who who's wearing them and who's not, it just runs the gamut of, of, you know, everybody wants to point out like, Oh, it's these, this group of people isn't doing it. This group of people is like, it's not, you know, it's just, people's choice. And I, I respect that, but I just don't think it's enough of an inconvenience to really make a big deal for anybody. And I think it's interesting that you're starting to see a ton of leagues, teams, schools, whatever kind of appeal to the sports aspect of it to, to kind of bring this back to, you know, why we're here and what we're talking about is there's been a ton of that stuff I, I will, know, either I will on say social media and- or different places like, you know, wear one of these so that we can have this. And it's like, you know, I don't know if it's just a case of like trying to appeal to a different part of people who are like, well, I didn't see it this way and I didn't want to do it before. But, you know, for people saying, hey, if this helps me get an NFL season, like that might be enough. Like that might seem crazy to us that that's what it takes to do it. But I you know, I, I will you know, applaud, I harm. you know, um, people can piece together probably where I sit politically by following me on Twitter and everything. But I will applaud our governor here and also your governor, Andy. I think that they've tried to do the right things at a slow pace, despite probably both of them being Republican governors, getting a lot of pressure uh, to do different. I, I've just been really impressed with those two guys and what they're, they're doing. And, and Holcomb really took a big risk in slowing down the, the, the advance here from July 4th in, in our state. And then the the signs that he is holding up that I wear a mask for, again, maybe we could argue whether it's too late or not, but... Again, it, it's not political to me. It's it's just about others. Um, I, I was raised that way by uh, my mom and my dad, and I'm proud to to care about others. It, you know, I will wear a mask every day I'm at school and every day I practice, and you know, I think I look better actually. So, I, I you know, the coaching thing is interesting because if people don't want to listen to politicians, they can maybe listen to coaches because I think we all want sports. We all need that level of normalcy back we're all sick of watching the same reruns of you know sec basketball from the 80s which was god awful anyway so it's just you know we don't want to watch that stuff so it's it is it is it to me you know in my opinion is it's sad that we have to debate it i respect people's disagreements on it but if you want to get back to it, and if you're not going to listen to a politician, listen to your beloved coach. Listen to the your football coach that you want to see on the sideline in the fall, to some capacity, and be in the stands to some capacity. Because you know I, that, you know, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> All right, where do we go from there? Who are we talking about next week? We got. We have Armand done. We have Jerome done. Do we know who we're talking about next? Chat mob, who do you want to talk about next week? Coach Roberts. I guess we got I'm trying to think who else is left. Oh, pressure. There you go. Oh, pressure. <laughs> I could. Oh, he's great. Have we done Trace yet? We haven't done Trace. Have we done Trace yet, or do we Trace largely do it by. Numbers. Did you guys know that? Yep. By, uh, by class, maybe. 
I don't, yeah, I don't. I'm trying to think of what we've done. Trace might be. Hey, maybe it would be up. Next we do need to get yeah, Jay. Jay's, we need. He's changing because of Jay to right? pop on here and talk about cooking. He he showed he was planning on cooking a lot of brisket and stuff this weekend. Made me hungry. I can't make he it. Down and to Galen are just Galen. Galen got everybody going with the the sale at Kroger. He's he's, he's good about that, and he, you know he's he's got. The, I think it's a black. Jay will know what it's called. It's like a black stone or something. It's just like it's like if you go to an old diner, it's like the grill that they. It's I, I saw it at his house the other day. It's amazing. You know, Galen's got all the great gadgets for. That's why he's such a good. He smokes meats great. You know, I mean, I mean, Galen goes to Kroger, tweets out the sale, and then I see Jay goes to Kroger. Who else went to Kroger? Zach Osterman went to Kroger. Probably sold out by you know two thirty, all the brisket. <laughs> I, I I don't know how to do that, and I'd be worried I'd spend that money and then ruin it. It's it's, it's all about patience and timing, you know. I I, I you know I come in, Jay says I got all the meats. Yeah, and that's you know <laughs> they cleared out Kroger. I love the you know Galen you know he chronicles all the all the meats. You have to have so much patience and you have to have so much diligence to to monitor meat i think one time last fall galen was up at like three o'clock in the morning monitoring the temperature of something and i was like that's dedication right there you know it's just you know megan's getting a little feisty she megan's says, megan couldn't find any meat at kroger's we we are in now we're at the true after dark i'm pretty sure the spare we're arguing about groceries too. yeah she got shrimp though so all right fellas thank you very much um, thanks for having cool. me guys Hey, good conversation. Thanks, Chat Mob, for.